I had to begin to focus on what was the solution. That this was not the only place that I'll be able to sell those products. And as I began to challenge myself and got some help and support and some other input, I eventually did. It took longer, but it was challenging. But I did it. Repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got that right. Repeat after me, please. It's possible. I can have my dream. I can get what I want. I must be creative and never give up. Now, let me share something else with you, ladies and gentlemen. When you know within yourself that there's something you want to do, and I believe that all of us were born with a purpose, that all of us have something that we are supposed to do, that all of us have some goodness within us, and that goodness gives us a responsibility to manifest our greatness. And when you know that, you can feel it in your guts, and you know that you're deliberately operating below your potential, you've gotten comfortable, you stop expanding, you stop stretching, you stop challenging yourself. Let me share something else with you. Not only is it possible for you to have your dream, but it's it's necessary, it's necessary that you have it, that you work on it, that you develop yourself, that you go for what is yours in the universe. I have a friend that at the beginning of the year I was in Los Angeles giving a speech and, and I do a seminar teaching people how to become involved in the speaking business and, and also one called Speaking with Power, teaching people how to begin to develop their communication skills. And this friend, I said, I want you to work with me. I called her up. She said, Les, are you sure I can do it? Sure you can. You have a PhD in communications. I don't have that. If I can do it, sure you can do it. In fact, I'm gonna give you the support that you need. Here's what I realized, ladies and gentlemen. We only have enough energy to take us to a certain level, but it's necessary that we assemble ourselves with other people who share our vision, other people that can see it for us to give ourselves a home court advantage. So it's necessary that you seek out other people who think like you, who are growing, who have decided that they are not satisfied with where they are. See, I don't believe that the necessity that necessity is the mother invention of invention. No. Necessity, in my opinion, is not the mother of invention. Refusing to accept things the way that they are is the mother of invention. When you decide I'm not going to settle for this, this is not going to be it for my life. I deserve more than this. See, that will start making you do some stuff. See, a lot of people go to work every day miserable and all they do is just talk about how miserable they are, but they don't do anything about it. So I was telling her that I knew she hated a job with a passion. I said, you can do this. you got more going for you than I have going for me. And we've been going through this for years, ladies and gentlemen. She'd been to my seminar speaking for a living. She brought her husband, and that was one of the major problems that I realized that happened in her life. He couldn't see it for her. So you got to make sure that you have people in your life that can see it for you, that will encourage you. Non-affirming relationships can hurt you. And I talked to him. I said, you know, I don't have anything to do with, with your marriage. I said, you and I are good friends and she and I are good friends. And, and I'm not taking sides. I said, but if you can't see it for her, don't tell her that. Just give her some support. What if you're wrong? It's possible, man, that, that if, if I'm doing it, she can do it. Well, you're different. How are you going to tell me that? You've seen her speak. She's got great speaking skills. Don't underestimate her. You don't know. You've got a great woman here. But you see, people who can't see it for themselves can't see it for you. He was happy. So I said, will you do it with me? I said, I'm going to give you the support you need. You can't do it by yourself. I will stand with you. She said, you will? I said, yes, I'm going to make you part of my seminar. You'll do a part of it and I'll do a part of it. Speaking with power. She said, okay. Three days later, ladies and gentlemen, I got an emergency call at my office. It was from a husband. He called and said, tell Les Brown that Marion is dead. I said, oh no. When I was flying there to go to the funeral and I remember the last time that I saw her and I had some of her papers that I had gotten inadvertently confused with mine and I took them home and I was searching through these papers to do one of her work. She was a prolific writer and what got me, what was so sad that made me begin to cry was that there were poems that she had started that were profound poems, great thoughts that she didn't complete. Plays that she had started that she didn't complete. See, that poem was given to her. I can't finish that for her, nor can you. That play, whatever the outcome that she had envisioned, that she had imagined, was given to her 
Only her. And that she's the channel that that was going to come through. You are here and you are the vessel. You are the outlet for the universe that you've been selected. There's something for you to do. I believe all of us have some purpose for being here. And as I was going to the funeral and I was reading a newspaper that said that that millions of people are dying because of, of what they're eating, talking about their diet. And I'm sure that it, it was Marion talking to me, whispering, saying, Les, the next time you speak, so that even more are dying because of what's eating them. Are you ready for something miraculous? One of the little boys that Rod Crew men mentored was a guy named Conrad, Ro Conrad Rowland. Conrad Rowland was an NFL football player eventually. Rod met him when he was a little boy, the same age when he met me. Conrad was the same age when he met me. And he took an interest in Conrad and believed in him. And Conrad went on to play for the Ravens and other NFL teams. He was in his off season, he was working out at the gym. Rod hadn't seen him in many, many years. He felt a click behind his right eye. He called his brother and said, I think something's wrong. His dad said, I felt we feared it was an aneurysm. Are you ready? This is the little boy that Rod Crew mentor. At the same time that that happened, Rod had a massive heart attack on a golf course and nearly died. At the same time, he nearly died. Thank God he was on the first hole and they were able to resuscitate him. And he was left with a few days to live. While Rod was in the hospital, Conrad passed away. Conrad donated a heart. Conrad was 29 years old. That heart saved Rod Carew's life and he's still alive today. So the lesson from that is that there's a there's a payoff, and even if there wasn't, you should do it, but the investment of belief in people, sowing seeds of belief, that's what makes you a leader. People say, what makes me a leader? Makes you a leader is your example. What makes you a leader is you investing belief and loving and caring about people. Any one of you in this moment could decide you're gonna lead because leadership is instilling something in someone that they don't see in themselves. Loving on them, believing them, seeing their giftedness. All of you, I don't care if you're loud or quiet, big here or small here, you could be a leader. The bottom line is you need to decide you wanna lead. You need to decide it's worth it. Our company's looking for leaders, leaders, and it's about your destiny. If you invest in enough people, there's a payoff for your destiny. I'm telling you right now, the more I'm here, the longer I'm here, my heart knows we're a company of destiny. We're a company where dreams come true. We're a company that stands for something. We're a company that changes lives. We're a company where dreams happen for people. You gotta believe that. You gotta believe you got a destiny. I hope you're hearing those people sitting with you saying, you can do this. You belong here. This is where you belong. This is where you can make it. I wanna talk to you about becoming a leader for a second. You gotta feel and know you're gonna lead. It's not just gonna happen, you have to make it happen. A few things you need to know is, listen, no one's gonna do anything for you. A couple rules of being a real leader. You need to take responsibility for your own life. Bring in energy to your team. Leading and recruiting. Leading in leadership. Leading in growth. Nobody owes you anything, but you owe other people everything. That's what a leader does. You take responsibility. You know exactly right now what you're not doing. It would be criminal of you to leave here and say, I don't know what to do. You know exactly what you're afraid of. You know exactly what you've been avoiding. And you got to make a decision to change it. You know exactly what it is. Don't BS anybody. You know what you need to do different. You you know the changes you need to make and if you can do that you stop kidding yourself you can win you can overcome your fear overcome procrastination whatever that is you know exactly what it is number two you got to compete I agree with what Monty said yesterday you don't have to be number one but dadgummit you better want to compete to be the best version of you you could possibly be your desire and will to win is everything I believe you win with intangibles with emotion with energy with passion and you gotta bring that. You know what we're really looking for right here? We're looking for some dogs, man, some road dogs. We're looking for some people that wanna get aggressive. How many road dogs we got out there? You know what I mean, right? I hear, I hear ladies go sometimes, some of the guys here, well, I don't know if I got a road dog in me. Ladies, let me tell you something. The hardest core road dogs in the world are women. Hey, ladies. Here's how we know. What if someone messed with your kid at school? You know how you get? You slap the hell out of a little kid if you have to, don't you? You don't give a crap. Well, guess what, ladies? Listen to me. You're letting the world slap the hell out of your family, and you're not doing anything about it. You're letting life slap the hell out of your kids and you. You're settling for average, aren't you? You're settling for ordinary, aren't you? See, you may not see the slap, but you can feel it. You need to stop letting the world slap your family around. It's time that stops right now. You say, that's the end of this. This family wins now. I'm leading this family. Change Change happens now. Say yes. Stop letting people hold you to your past. Yeah, man, I got what I used to do, but I'm trying to do better now. Stop letting people tie you to what they saw you do five, ten years ago. You can go on the internet and say whatever you want to say about me in the past. Got all that. Was who I was, but I am who I am, and I'm cool with both of them people. You got to be not all right to get all right. You got to be lost to get saved. 
You got to have been through something to know something. So please get comfortable with that put. Get get comfortable with that part. I don't know what I'm doing on time, so I'm just going to go ahead. Okay, cool. Here we go. This is the one I really wanted to do because this one describes my life to the T. When I left college, I flunked out of college after three years. When I worked at Ford Motor Company, one of the last jobs I had because of the layoffs was they put me in the foundry. I learned a valuable lesson in the foundry because I used to be a foundry worker at Ford Motor Company. I'm now a spokesperson for Ford. Let me tell you how the flip went. A lot of people don't know, but in the foundry, they was making engine blocks. Engine blocks start with scrap metal. See, people, you think old cars just go away. No, they go to junkyards. Companies take this scrap metal and they melt the metal down. But it starts with scrap. They run it through a furnace, and when it gets in the furnace, they liquefy the metal. Then they take this metal and they pour it into a mold. This mold is the engine block. But when you pour it in there, it's just hot. It's just hot. It ain't nothing. And you think that you can't do nothing with that. But then something comes along and gets a hold of it. Something comes and gets a hold of it. It takes this hot piece of mess that was scrap. It lifts it. It dips it. It cools it. It refinishes it. It hardens it. And then it puts it on a conveyor belt. When it come out the conveyor belt, my job was to hit it with a sludge hammer and knock the loose flashing out. That's empty extra metal on it. And then you have an engine block. The basic of any engine is the block. You got a cracked block, you can throw that engine away. It don't work. But the block starts from scrap metal. This really how God do it, though. See, God takes scrap. All engine blocks is scrap. He takes scrap. He molded it. He poured into it. Then he come out, he cool it. He shaped and he start putting stuff on it. He start attaching pieces to it. He put a manifold on it. He put the rocker arm on it. He put the exhaust on it. He put spark plugs on it. He put a carburetor on it. He put a fan belt, water pump, and he take it and he put it in a car. But all of it started when it was a piece of scrap metal, man. We cannot do as Christians. It's just cause we the car now. You can't look at the dude that's in the furnace that's got that's just wet liquid. That's a hot mess. You can't look back at the scrap pile and go, they just scraps, man. Cause what you don't understand is you got to have that scrap so you can make a block so God can put stuff on it. So when you put it on it, you can be a car one day. I just want everybody to let everybody be a block, man. Let them be a hot mess in a furnace. Let them be a scrap, man. You ain't got nothing to do with that. That's God right there, man. That's all I'm trying to say. That's all. You got to get ready mentally. And this is where Shof went to work on me, to be ready mentally, to develop the philosophy and also be able to defend your virtues and your values. Let's go through it. You need a good library. Shof got me started on my library. Here's one of the books he recommended, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich. Shof said to me, doesn't that book title intrigue you? Think and Grow Rich. Don't you have to read that book? Think and Grow Rich. I said, yes, sir by Napoleon Hill. I went and found that book in a used bookstore. That's where I had to start. In a used bookstore. I paid less than 50 cents for it. I've still got it. It's one of the rare hardback covers. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Wow, Shof was right. Get a library started. It'll change your life. Any home over $200,000 has got a library. Why do you suppose that is? Wouldn't that make you curious? How come every home over $200,000 has got a library? Does that tell you something? Does that educate you at all? You say, well, I can't afford a $200,000 home. It doesn't matter what size home. Take your present apartment, clean out a closet, call it your library, and start acting intelligent. <laughs> and start this process like I did. Start developing a library. Here's what your library needs to show, that you're a serious student of health and life, spirituality, culture, uniqueness, sophistication, economics, prosperity, 
Productivity, sales, management, skills, values of all kind. Let your library show you're a serious student. Don't be casual in learning. Don't be lazy in learning. Information is the key. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. Learning is the beginning of prosperity. Learning is the beginning of democracy, the beginning of freedom. All values, all virtues start with the learning process. So don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in gathering the library that will teach you and instruct you. And I got that book, Think and Grow Rich. Some of the ideas in that book inspired me no end, helped me to change my life. Now, it's got some weird stuff in it. You know, it's got some weird stuff. Napoleon was weird. So you got to separate out a little of this weird stuff. But you can do that. You can separate out the weird stuff. Okay. Unless you're weird, just do the weird stuff. <laughs> anyway, remember, don't be a follower, be a student. That's the key to all books. Don't be a follower, be a student. Another book he recommended. Help me become financially independent. We're going to cover that before we finish this afternoon. The book was entitled, The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson, C-L-A-S-O-N. This little book, The Richest Man in Babylon, I use it as a textbook teaching teenagers how to be rich by 40, living in America, 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. I got rich by the time I was 31, didn't wait till 35. You find a unique opportunity. So we'll get into that after we come back from our next break. Richest Man in Babylon, get your library started. Here are some key sections to put in your library called mental food. In fact, we call it food for thought. It's so important to nourish the mind, not just the body, but nourish the mind. Key phrase. Now it needs to be well balanced. You can't live on mental candy. Somebody says, well, I just read this positive stuff. That's too second grade. You gotta get out of second grade. You can't just be inspired. You gotta be taught. You can't just be inspired. You gotta be educated. Key. Here's a good book. It's called How to Read a Book. Good title. How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. In this book, How to Read a Book, Mortimer, you know, is the, is the chief editor of the new Encyclopedia Britannica. A good set of books, right, to have in your library. Encyclopedia Britannica, chief editor, Mortimer Adler. He's still in, he's in his 80s. He's still active, still writing books. I've got several of his books, The Six Great Ideas, a lot of books, Mortimer Adler. But he wrote this book, How to Read a Book. Now, in this book, How to Read a Book, not only does he give you some good suggestions on how to get the most out of a book. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to get the best out of it. He'll give you some techniques on how to get the best out of a book. It's very good. But here's what's also in his book, How to Read a Book, a list of what he calls the best writings ever written, the best writings ever written. I've used it as a centerpiece for my library. So I'm just asking you, take a look. If it suits you, fine. If it doesn't suit you, hey, keep looking until you find something to suit you. But well balanced. Let me give you some of that balance. Number one, history. We've all got to have a sense of history. American history, national history, international history, family history, political history. We all need a sense of history. Shortest history lesson. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. No matter how far back you go, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand, four thousand years ago, I'm telling you it all reads the same. Once you understand the thread that it isn't going to change, then what's going to change for my life? Answer. Looks like I'm going to have to change. History helps us to understand how it is, what there is to work with, seed, soil, sunshine, rain, and what human beings have done with it in the past, and how many of them have, like I did by age 25, they have messed up. That's what history's for. Be a good student of history. Here's a good book, Lessons of History by Durant. Lessons of History by Durant. This little book is only 100 pages, but I'm telling you, it's so well written, you'll be intrigued as I was. This little book, Lessons of History by Durant. Next is philosophy. Durant also wrote a good book on philosophy. The story of philosophy. It's got a good rundown of the key philosophers of the last several hundred years, what they taught and some of the lives they lived. You might find it a little difficult, but hey, you can't just read the easy stuff. Key phrase to add here in parentheses, don't just read the easy stuff. You won't grow, you won't change, you won't develop. Tackle the more difficult stuff. Next, novels. Novels are good. Sometimes an intriguing story keeps our attention so that the author can weave in the philosophy he or she is trying to get across. Anne Rand was probably better at that than anybody else I could possibly think of. Atlas shrugged some of those towering novels. The novel kept us intrigued, but guess what she was doing all the time? Feeding us her philosophy, feeding us her philosophy. Now, whether you agreed with her philosophy or not, you had to admit she was really good at getting it out there, weaving it through the story, in the dialogue and in the speeches and in the text. That is novel. Novels are good. Now, here's a little personal advice. Skip the trash. You know, Someone says, well, sometimes you can find something valuable in a trashy novel. I wouldn't go through it to find it. You can find a crust of bread in a garbage can, but I wouldn't go through it. Number one, you don't need the reputation. 
So not enough time to read the brilliant stuff, the good stuff. Skip the trash, really. My personal advice on personal development, becoming more valuable than you are.